Good day, folks. We'd like to take a moment to give you a 2023 update on our homestead, what we're growing, what we're planting, and uh, hopefully you get some ideas from this. And we'd love if you'd share some ideas of y'all's in the comments below. We're always learning. We're gonna start in the front here, which is our pollinator zone. Danny's rose bush looks like it's settling in good. It's gonna have a, a rose on it this year. We've got some mullen that planted itself here. This is an herb, serves many functions. We get it popping up from time to time around the property here, and we just love to let it grow. My friend's mom who passed away used to make these sell them to help fund their cancer treatments. She's a good sister in Christ. And I would pray her soul was resting with her Lord and Savior. Okay, where are you? You see what I mean? That these stupid cutworms are destroying our property? Look at that. Shoot it right now. Right off the stock. Now we gotta find him and end him. Oh, he's in here somewhere. <sighs> this is why we can't have nice things. Ah, there he is. Knew he'd be in here somewhere. You stupid idiot. See that? Well, at least in this instance, it looks like our strawberry will survive. Ah, oh, stupid idiot. So frustrating. Trying to have nice things, trying not to use harmful chemicals, and these idiots keep taking advantage of that. So guess what? There's a harmful piece of bark for you, buddy. So, now that we've taken care of that threat, hopefully that strawberry will recover. It looks like it's got a fresh leaf coming out. I think we'll be all right. As long as that doesn't get bit off too. We've got two blackberries we planted up here. Now these are dwarf plants, so they won't take this over completely. And we don't want this whole thing to be choked out by those. Because we want to have a mix of blackberries and strawberries. Now if you look over here, we've got a little carpet of strawberries starting and those were accidentally planted well not really accidentally they just weren't planned i guess we had them planted in here two years back we planted them in here we had a few extras from the ones we used to plant in our raised bed put them in that pot that pot down there and uh, the runners drooped over the porch planted themselves there and there and then last year they spread the whole way out to here and gave us an idea that we would like this whole thing to be carpeted just like that with strawberries i think that would be so cool so we got a head start we dug up a couple runners from over there and we put one right there and the one that you saw got attacked by that cutworm is the one we put right there so I just think that would be so cool to have a whole carpet of strawberries up here. Tell me what y'all think about that. It's... Uh, we're under attack this year in the worms, the hawks. I don't know if you guys can hear that hawk. He's right down the hauler down there. He just flew around our property and and thank God the cat was around and chased it off, which is rare because they're usually useless. But thankfully in this instance, they actually served their purpose. So we're on a push this year to plant some pollinator attractors, right? So down here we've got some flocks. This is new this year. Uh, unfortunately, this is also a favorite treat of the cutworms, so we're going to be especially vigilant with that. We planted two of them there last year that the cutworms completely destroyed and killed, so we had to replace them. Uh, here's some of the ones that survived last year that are under attack big time this year. 
that one had eight different stalks and now it's down to only one now we've got diatomaceous earth around it right now but that seems to hardly slow them down and this one the one and only stock that came back this year was mowed to the ground and thankfully it's seems to be coming back and we're hoping that this diatomaceous earth and every single night danny and i are out here picking them off and uh it's <laughs> for lack of a better phrase we're cutting the cutworms yeah we're just taking some scissors out here and snipping them up seems to be at least slowing them down so their plants surviving but they are under attack we've got a little little herb situation going on here we got some lavender that we had seeded a couple years back uh, we actually we're trying to propagate that we got a cutting of it we took so we could fill in that little gap right there but that's only two plants it's starting to fill in kind of nice be pretty cool if that kind of just comes up over and fills in that whole area right there and danny and i also were talking about doing a perennial herb garden up here because these railroad ties were here whenever i got the property they're all rotted out they need replaced um so i ripped all the ivy out because this was just a trough full of ivy with a few daffodils sprinkled throughout so i ripped all the ivy out this spring and then we put a few annuals in here this year just to have something in here but the more we got to thinking about it with these railroad ties here for i mean they've been here for at least 20 30 years uh, with all the creosote on those leaching into that dirt i'm not sure i want to be eating anything that comes out of there so we're kind of thinking this is just going to be our annual flower garden and each year we're going to plant annuals in there and i think next year we're going to rip these railroad ties out and put in some well probably some of those return, retaining wall stones something similar to what's on the porch over there and just fence that in and this will be our annual flower garden which unfortunately is also under attack from cutworms They've damaged this plant pretty good. I don't know if it's going to make it. It's got a big old chunk out of the stock. Seems to be hardening up a little bit. Um, sewing some roots down, so I don't know. It might make it. You can see the stock down there is real rough looking. Hopefully that one makes it. Um, yeah, stupid cutworms. And also, we had sunflowers coming up. The cutworms ruined those too. So I had to replant those ones, but it looks like the other ones are are doing all right there's some sunflowers uh, those are some pretty purple annuals so they'll get a few i think three to three to five feet tall they said so we kind of just tried to alternate those with the daffodils we got some sunflowers a purple annual and we got some marigolds as well to hopefully ward off the deer because that's usually what takes out our sunflowers I'd say those daffodils are ready to be shorn down to the ground. We usually try to let our daffodils around the property stay out until they start looking like this. Just to give them ample opportunity to harvest that sunlight and build up their bulbs so they come back strong next year. Oh, and looky. There's a sunflower that was cut by the cutworms. Yeah, and a stupid slug. Look at that. Yep. See what I mean? We are under attack. Ah, oh, it's a shame. That is just a shame. I don't have to replant those ones too. After I kill this slug, he will not be eating another sunflower. You see that? Maybe we'll say just pick him off and put them in some soapy water but I don't have soapy water and I do have a stick so that slug will not be attacking our sunflowers again but unfortunately too late for the sunflower because it is now dead oh it's frustrating I mean this one's about on its way out of this life uh, you better go ahead and Strengthen his stock up and get growing. He ain't gonna make it very long if he don't. And this is with us coming out every single night and picking off worms and slugs from these plants, and they're still getting destroyed. Very frustrating. 
Now we got some nominal success with some hollyhocks here. In fact, I got two of them coming up. Those will be, I think they say they're five to six foot tall. That'd be pretty cool. Over here, playing some echinacea, which looks like it's coming up. It's the only one we've got so far coming up echinacea wise. And then Danny's friend gave her some sedum, which is pretty hard to kill. Unless you've got a property full of cutworms. Look over there, that's all the stalks that the stupid cutworms have cut off at their base. And uh, as you can see, it's probably about a third of them. So again, we're up here every night trying to keep them off. Um, having some nominal success. I mean, it's still alive for now. So thanks to Danny's friend at work for that. And hopefully we can keep it alive. And another thing that Danny's friend at work got us is this creeping phlox, which as you can see, it is looking like it's holding on for dear life. But again, every single night, there's two to three cutworms that just propagate out of nowhere and come out and attack this poor plant. This is one of three we planted, but it is the only one that looks like it's going to make it because the other ones, you guessed it, have been completely destroyed by cutworms. Planted some more echinacea over here. And here's some hollyhocks. Plant those three little groupings right there. So that's cool to see those germinating. So here's another addition. We have added six egg chickens this year to our existing five. So that ought to give us an even 11. Plus, we got a little mystery bird down there. We <laughs> order from McMurray Hatchery. And uh, each time you make an order from them, they give you the option of getting a free unsexed mystery bird. So we have no idea what this one is. It is pretty. We just hope that it is a hen and not a rooster because, as you can see, we've got neighbors. We've got neighbors. We're not trying to be those neighbors. So if it's a rooster, unfortunately, it will not be around terribly longer. Uh, probably be about four or five months or so till we know for a fact um, but either way it won't go to waste it will fill our bellies either with eggs or with a chicken roast so hopefully it's a hen because that'd be cool to keep it around it is a pretty bird i don't know if you guys can see it or not but it's got nice speckles it kind of looked like it had a leopard print on it whenever it was a brand new chick which is just pretty cool Definitely something I hadn't seen before, and yeah, hopefully it's not a rooster. Peonies getting ready to bloom any day now. Those always smell awesome, so that's exciting. These trough planters are always nice to. Some lettuce or spinach in there. Nice to uh, walk out the back porch and just add something to your sandwich or to your salad. Pretty convenient. In fact, I would argue having the salad bar out here is about as convenient as it gets. And continuing around to the backyard, got a few other spots we planted echinacea. Hasn't come up just yet. Got some hollyhocks over here. Those have germinated though. That's pretty cool. And we've already taken care of it this morning, but we got another cutworm back here too. Sawing down another strawberry. So that sucks. Um, he's around here somewhere, so it's gonna keep digging. I actually haven't found him. I've been digging trying to find him though, but he's gotta be in here somewhere. He couldn't have gone too far. Let's Let's try to capture that on camera. Getting another kill here. Yeah. I know he's here. I ain't gonna give up till I find him. Mm -hmm. He is in here. I know he is. The dirty bugger. But yeah, like I was saying, I mean, we're just trying to spread these, the old strawberries around the property here. Cause I think that would just be so cool to have a carpet of strawberries in every flower bed. I mean, that would be cool.
So I had to get like right up to the stock. That last one, I had to get right up to the stock to find it. So it's like, part of you is don't, <laughs> doesn't want to damage your plant trying to save it. The other part of you is like, there won't be a plant if I don't take care of this threat. And it's kind of just trying to walk that fine balance. <laughs> Found him. There he is, the stupid idiot. I knew there was one in here somewhere. And there he is. And there he isn't. He got it, but I got him, so won't be causing further issues. Just so frustrating, you know. You all this work have this dream of growing food and not polluting the environment with more chemicals. And you just come out and out they come so we're going to keep fighting the good fight though we're not going to let that discourage us here's our meat birds they're growing big and strong already they're going to get ready to get moved tomorrow um so we're on this is only their second day of being here and it's already starting to get pretty manured up and we're very quickly to the point where it's going to be every single day we're going to be moving them to a new paddock a we want to get them out of their excrement, make sure they have nice, happy lives, healthy lives, and they're not laying around in their own dung. They're also it's pretty hot manure. We don't want to kill all the grass. We want it to help and fertilize, but not kill our grass. So that's what we're going to do. All I got here is a pretty simple contraption. I mean, this lets them escape from aerial predators keep out of the sun I mean that aluminum especially in hot summer we're fast approaching that reflects sunlight so that stays decently cool underneath there uh, nice shade and also lets them get out of the weather rain hail whatever and if it gets too cold we just put a tarp over it give it some makeshift walls and we've used that in the past to keep them we have a late frost in the season or something keep them out of wind elements and just a simple electric net around it. Now our coyote decoy, not sure if it's making a difference or not. We haven't lost one since we put that out there. I did see a possum and a skunk poking around here the other day. And I've counted our chickens. They all seem to be there still. We got 25 of them here. They just chilling underneath their enclosure. Something I'm pretty excited about over here which we love. We love fruit in this family, our berries. And uh, we planted a few raspberries of our own. And a couple of years back, we noticed that well, the good Lord had planted some raspberries for us as well. And they are starting to propagate. And uh, I was letting this little area go back to the woods. But I am really excited to report that this is starting to turn into raspberry hill if you look behind me here there's one coming up there 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 and then back there is all the ones that had already planted themselves I mean, these are good thick healthy stocks i mean you can see all the berries and blossoms on there a lot of them have already been pollinated you can see look at that, look at that green berry right there i mean that thing is that's gonna be some good raspberries and there's another bush back there and i mean i just envisioned this whole area being covered with raspberries someday i think that'd be so cool something else we're looking into is a native fruit to this area it's called a pawpaw tree it is the largest native fruit that there is in america um i was watching a video on it the other day and they were saying it tastes like a cross between a banana and a mango, which just sounds interesting to me. Sounds like a tropical fruit and not something that you would expect to be grown here in Kentucky. So we were looking, looking into maybe getting a couple varieties of them and planting them there, uh, maybe a little further down the hill than the raspberries. And uh, the way I understand it, they propagate through suckers just like poplar trees do. So, I mean, I think that would be so cool to have like a stand of pawpaw trees down there, you know, native plants, something that's not going to be an invasive, like all this bush honeysuckle we got growing around here and autumn olives. 
uh, but something we can still get food from. Uh, we love all the olives, they are tasty, make some good jelly. We're gonna try fruit leather this year too. Maybe make some, some juice out of them, some pop or something. Um, but they are invasive at the end of the day and we wanna try to stick with natives the best we can. And, and here we are, we've got native raspberries coming up everywhere. And if we could have this upper side be covered with black raspberries, and the lower side be covered with pawpaws. That would be so cool. Um, and also, just something something neat to do with the kids, you know, make making your own food and foraging off your own land. And the good Lord has blessed you with. That's pretty cool stuff. Also, even if these plants did plant themselves, it is still work to harvest them. So, I hope that instills a good work ethic in our children. Without work, there is no reward. And uh, no reward is sweeter than a pocket full, a handful of fresh raspberries on a hot summer's day. That is going to be awesome. So, yeah, super pumped about that. Um, also, if y'all were looking at establishing your homestead with some, you know, domesticated berries. I mean, raspberries, strawberries seem to be the way to go, at least in this soil type. I mean, it is a little higher pH, a lot of clay and uh, doesn't seem to be very conducive to blueberry growing we found we did have nine bushes three of them unfortunately succumbed to their injuries and we ended up ripping them out this year and tossed them in the fire pit because they did not make it it's a lot of clay and we tried amending the soil but man there's only so much you can do with that i mean it doesn't look like this row is much longer for this world. I mean, we've been trying to use high acid fertilizers, mirror acid. We've been trying to um, use more natural means, you know, of acidifying the soil. I mean, we have put, I think it's called elemental sulfur on them. And it uh, just doesn't seem to be making much of a difference. So thinking we're about to give up on the blueberries here it's not looking too promising i mean look at that that poor plant its leaves are already turning orange and red even though it's only may <laughs> this one it's got just a handful of leaves on it doesn't look like it's going to make it and we're going to get a few berries out of this one this year as we do every year but this is a six-year-old blueberry bush, and you would expect it to be much taller than that at this point. I don't think this one's going to make it through the year. This one, again, going to have a couple handfuls of berries like we do every year. But again, a six-year-old blueberry bush, not even up to my knee. I don't know if y'all can see that. Not even up to my knee. And it's just languishing. This one, however, looks like it's doing awesome, except we never get blueberries on it. Last year we had, I'd say we got about a quart off it, but we're gonna get zero off it this year. Uh, for whatever reason, these little, here's the, um, let me see if you can see that. That's the little blossom that never came out. We've got those all over the place. They just never went to blossom. This, this whole bush, I mean, this is almost as tall as me and there's just no blueberries on it so even though it seems to be healthier about the size you would expect for a plant that sold six years it just never gives us blueberries so it might as well not even be there so we're kind of kind of on the cusp of just giving up on the blueberries entirely it wasn't meant to be here and moving on with our lives and replacing them with fruit trees and these means my next plan which is the fruit tree plan so these peach trees we just put in last year and they are already jamming i mean i don't know if you can see that or not but already even this one is doing the worst out of the two it's already taller than me it's only been in here for one year um so we're we're pretty pumped about that they look like they're doing all right this one's doing a little bit better uh but not much i mean they're they're both doing very well that's some pretty thick foliage let me look at that only been in there for a year it's already starting to starting to jam over here and what do you know we've already got a little peach coming on right there that is so cool one year and we've already got a peach 
So, we're thinking those are gonna do a little better than the blueberries. So we're probably gonna tear this middle row up here sometime, maybe next year, put two new fruit trees in there. Uh, the only problem is we can't do anything that is like in the apple family, so no pears, no apples, nothing like that. It would be cool to have a pear tree or an apple tree or a few of those, but we have a disease, a fungus around here that spends its life cycle bouncing around between apple trees, trees in the apple family, and cedar trees. Um, there's two different types of fungus we have in this neighborhood. One is called cedar apple rust, and the other is called cedar quince rust. And we've got both of them. Um, I don't see any active galls from the cedar apple rust around here, but I did see several instances of the cedar quince rust. I mean, you can see some evidence of it. You've got some dieback on some of these branches here. I mean, uh, right there, you can see some dieback on those. Uh, the, the cedar quince rust kind of establishes on the stalk and everything downstream of that tends to die off. That's pretty weird. It's like an orange goo. We talked to the lady from the Kentucky Department of Forestry though, and she was saying it mostly is not a disease that is fatal to your cedar trees. So we're hoping that, I mean, it'll just run its course and it may be something they live with, but we definitely don't want to give it more host than it already has. I mean, these old cedar trees were here and moved here. We ain't gonna cut them down for that. Um, it wouldn't really make sense to cut a plant down to avoid it being affected because then it would be dead and wouldn't really matter. Uh, so we're just gonna remove the host. So we're not putting any apple trees in, although we would like them. We're not putting any pear trees in either. And in fact, just to give an example of how quickly this fungus spreads, I mean, the scent spores out in the wind. We got some crab apple trees for free and we didn't really know what to do with them. So we just stuck them in the front yard and literally within two to three weeks of them getting buds and getting their leaves out there they already had spots in their leaves from this this fungus so it's it's pretty i mean it's it's pretty prolific here in this neighborhood so we're not going to plant anymore but we are going to plant other fruit trees like peaches and our our newest addition this year we put cherry trees in and they got the buds coming out in the leaves they seem to be doing all right so far so we're going to keep an eye on those and uh, like to add some manure to them to get them kind of jump started here before much longer and then get some good thick mulch down there some wood chips so hopefully we get some cherries next year out of those and along with the peach trees giving us some more fruit as well and then over here our raspberries seem to be doing all right especially the black raspberries. We're gonna get a decent crop out of those this year if we keep the birds off them. Uh, lots and lots of blossoms on those black raspberries and red raspberries, I mean, they're alive, but <laughs> they also, they get hit pretty hard. We got a rabbit that was literally living underneath the one row, the especially you can see how sparse these ones are. It was living down underneath the ground down that end. Um, and basically every new shoot that has been coming up for the past two years has just gotten chewed straight back down to the ground. So the good news is though these send out suckers and that's how they, they propagate. And we got a couple of them from over on this row and planted them into this row. So hopefully we could thicken these up and I mean, it'd be great to have the wildlife be able to share the place with us, but we also can't have them killing every plant that we planted. Otherwise, what's the point? So. We're trying to deal with that. The red raspberries just don't seem to be jamming quite as much as the black raspberries do. I think that just might be because they're not native. I mean, we've been trying to keep them watered, keep them healthy, give them food as we can, keep them mulched. And uh, I mean, they're, well, I think this is the fourth year they've been in the ground. I mean, they're definitely starting to fill it in pretty nicely in here. Um, but part of the problem may be that they're getting attacked from the rabbits whenever they're brand new stalks. And then you can see none of these are very tall, which the raspberries, the red raspberries I had grown up as a kid were up like, over top of my head in some areas. Um, and that's because 
once they get to a certain height and start getting berries on them, then the deer start attacking them. And we've had deer foraging and browsing in here before. And what the rabbits don't get, the deer trim back. And that's kind of why our red raspberries just don't seem to be jamming as much. So hoping we can help affect some positive change in that area. For now, it's looking pretty sad, but we're hoping that the black raspberries eventually give us to a spot where we won't even worry about the red raspberries. Um, and part of the reason I'm so excited about the black raspberries is we had enough suckers that came off of these stalks because I don't know if you guys are familiar or not with, with how black raspberries propagate, but these new green stalks, the first year, the fresh growth, these canes will double over and grow into the ground and where they hit the ground, that will sprout roots and then you will have a new stalk come up. So we had that happen enough times this year that we were able to put a whole brand new row in, bow free. That is all raspberries that we spent zero pennies on coming up. So that is just an excellent, excellent fruit to add to your homestead, these cane fruits. They propagate so well. I mean, and even red raspberries, they're propagating well despite being attacked by creatures that want nothing more than to saw them down to the ground, and they're still making it. We're still getting a few pints each year of red raspberries um, and black raspberries. We're gonna get even more than that this year, so we're just pumped. Over here is the composting station. This is a you know, pretty simple handmade, homemade pallet structure. This is our holding area. Right now we just got grass clippings in it that we're going to use to mulch our garden with once we put our vegetable garden in. Um, we usually put some newspapers down and cover it with a few inches of grass clippings. So the first few times of the year we cut grass, save the clippings up for that. That keeps weeds down. Uh, it also keeps your, your vegetables from drying out their roots in the summertime, those hot summer months between waterings. And uh, also, a lot of people don't want to do a garden because they're worried about how much work it's going to be. Weeding and hot summer months, drenching sweat, pulling up these weeds. But if you mulch it all when you first plant it, you ain't going to get as many weeds coming up. And it makes the whole, enjoy, the whole experience much more enjoyable. So we're all about that life. Work harder or work smarter, not harder. So we... Put the grass clippings in there until we put the garden in. And then after that, this is our holding area for our chickens, their guts. You know, whenever we harvest our meat chickens, we compost everything. Their guts, their entrails, you know, their their feathers. Anything that we're not eating, putting in the freezer, goes up here. And we cover it in, you know, six, eight, sometimes more, if we have it, inches of wood chips to keep the smell down. So we don't get things digging it up so we can actually get a successful compost out of it. And what we do is we basically just let it sit there all summer long and then in the fall when we harvest our fall run of meat chickens we'll do the same thing there let it sit all winter long um, and then throughout the the fall and winter any kitchen waste we get gets tossed up there as well any any yard waste that we're not going to use for mulching the garden goes in there we just hold that up there and then once the new year comes and the old compost is finished we go ahead and move that into the garden, which we get about a cubic yard of compost each year, which is just awesome. I mean, it seems to really be turning a page on the soil health of our garden. It's no longer solid clay that is just, I mean, you can't grow anything in it and it cracks in the summer. Now it's getting to be a lot more aerated, you know, a lot more organic matter built into it. So we're, we're pretty excited about the, the progress of the garden. I can't wait to show you us tilling it up just to see what the what the um, soil health is looking like this year. I mean, it just gets darker, more loamy, you know, more, I mean, less clumpy. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just, the plants seem to love it. They get a little bigger, a little healthier each year. So we're just going to keep building that soil up, and this is how we're doing it. So then, once we get done with our holding area, we move all that into here. And each time we cut grass, we put a whirlbro load of yard waste into here and turn this over and then we turn it over in between at the middle point between grass cuttings as well and we just kind of keep this thing turning at least once or twice a week to keep it heated up and uh, to kill off some of those bad bacteria. i mean we 
typically have this thing sitting around 130 to 140 for a little while just to get it to a point where it's going to kill those bad bacteria off and also it breaks down that uh material that's going into there and uh, turns it into that nice dark lovely compost that we we just think our garden is just chamming because of it so here's our compost we got from last year it's been kind of stomped down and spread out we put the chickens in our garden a few weeks before we till it under and plant it each year just to get some good fresh manure in there and we're going to wait to till that under probably three weeks between the chickens leaving and tilling it under just because chicken manure is pretty hot we want to let it cool off a little bit break down a little bit or else it'll just kill our plants that we put in the ground which we don't want but here's that nice beautiful looking compost i mean check that out i mean that is that is good looking stuff right there and then we get about a cubic yard of that each and every year i mean look at the freaking worms that you'll find inside of here man that is just full of worms fat buggers and bury him we want to keep those around folks <laughs> and then we're trying something we have never tried before on our homestead we got three little rows in the raised bed here of celery which it seems to have survived as transplanting we we uh, seeded these about two months ago and uh, now that the, we're past the last frost and it's not even going down in the 40s hardly at night Felt like we were safe to put those in the ground here. And uh, those new dark green leaves are the new leaves that they've put on in the past week since being out here. So we're pretty pumped about that. I think they're going to do real well. We had five lettuce plants planted on each side of this. But as you can see, there's only three left here and four left there. You'll never guess what did that. Oh yes, it was the cutworms that we are being attacked and invaded by. So... Oh, and we also lost three onions on the other side. Those stupid idiots. But the onions are recovering. It looks like one of those three onions that the cutworms attacked may actually be coming back. So maybe we only lost two onions. But yeah, so we, we're taking care of each cut. Each time we see a plant get destroyed, we dig around it. We find a cutworm, destroy it. And uh, I don't know. It's like we're going to have three lettuces and four on that side. They seem to be doing all right. So we might be successful in defending those, but we got some, about half white and half red onions up there. Say about another month or so away from those being harvestable, which that's pretty cool, you know. So we're only in May and we're already going to be having to harvest here another month or so. It's, it's pretty neat. The lettuce. And over here, you know, we got our little trellis we put in there, which is a uh, pro tip with that is instead of getting a cattle panel which is what i've seen a lot of people use for these this is just that reinforcement they put inside of concrete sidewalks yeah about a, a half maybe a third of the price of getting just the actual dedicated cattle panel i mean unless you're growing something super heavy i mean that's that's robust enough to hold some some plants which we typically only do peas on this one and so here's our row of peas right here this year they're in our strawberry bed we just you know rotate our crops each year so this year they're in the strawberry bed they're just about tall enough to hit that thing uh the ones that are starting to fall over we're going to tie them up so they can start getting trained to crawl up that trellis in another month or so and they're going to be on that trellis climbing right up it and we'll have some good snow peas here which we love those they are yummy and then our strawberry bed just crazy a lot of that compost that was mixed in with this topsoil is breaking down as you can see this was filled up to the top board and it has almost shrunk in half in just the past this is what it's third year so going on three years this has shrunk in half and that compost breaking down and we put a layer of logs in the bottom too uh, on top of a layer of cardboard you know to form a weed barrier and we put the, the logs on top of that and those logs break down over time using you know we're utilizing the hugel culture concept so they break down they help regulate soil temperatures they hold in moisture so you're also regulating soil moisture and as they break down they also add nutrients to the soil so we put those down we put a layer of peat moss on top of that and then compost topsoil mix and that's all starting to break down pretty good so we're gonna take all these strawberries out 
next year and we're going to move them to that raised bed and then that'll be our strawberry bed going forward for the next few years after that and then this will be the vegetable garden bed so i'm going to build this back up with some topsoil next year before we do all of that and then next year also we want to put two two more raised beds but shorter ones down here and if you wonder why we're not just extending our in-ground garden a couple of reasons number one is because first and foremost we have very shallow topsoil here we only got you know as little as 13 inches in some spots which i found through digging those posts for the the garden over there and some, some of it is up to two two and a half feet deep on the upper end of that garden but it's pretty shallow so our lateral field had to be very shallow and very wide right so this entire graston area from these raised beds over to that wood line is our lateral field as marked off by the home inspectors that came and and marked that off i moved here so don't really want to be tilling on top of my lateral field and covering myself and my family in poop water so we are building on top of the lateral field hence the raised beds so we got two of them in there right here next year i'd like to do two more i do them lower um, i had those ones built a little higher because the strawberries are perennials i wanted them to set, send down deep roots uh, since they're going to be in there for the long haul and surviving through the winter and also we wanted to do like tubers and stuff that doesn't grow so well in this clay soil this hard clay soil and grow those things in that raised bed right there maybe some of the earlier stuff to plant stuff that you know we don't want to wait until late may to plant it because it'll be too late in the season so we're putting all that stuff in that one uh another thing about this neighborhood is we are also inundated with the uh, white butterflies that lay their eggs on uh, things like broccoli cauliflower and cabbage you know your cold crops and uh, their spawn that hatch from those eggs i mean they just obliterate plants we we tried broccoli one year in the the in-ground garden and they just wrecked it i mean it was nothing left so we decided before we ever plant any of those types of things again we are going to put in low tunnels so both raised beds we're putting down here will be for that very purpose we're gonna have a low tunnel going down that way and we're hoping that'll help keep those off of there and you know, put a cloth covering on it not a plastic one so we don't want to overheat things and, and fry them but we also want to keep the bugs off them so that was our plan is for that well and the homestead update wouldn't be complete without showing you all what we're putting in our garden this year as the store shelves become more and more empty and things look a little more bleak around the world we just considered it wise to be able to plant some stuff and take a little bit of what we need to sustain ourselves into our own hands and on top of that, it's a good bonding experience with the little girl. Alrighty, so here's the compost we made this year. Just gonna spread this out and try to incorporate it as best we can into the rest of the garden. And then we're gonna till it in. Good job, baby girl. What are you doing, Harper? Uh, you, you planting corn? Yeah, no corn. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last one. <laughs> Good job. Now, what does the seed packet say? How did we got to bury him? One inch, I think, for corn. Three quarter to an inch. Harper, no, leave him in there. Put it back. Put it back. All righty. <laughs> and now we got to bury them. Now we buried them up. Here, bury them up, Harper. Harper, we're all done. Look. Yeah, we're burying them, Harper. They ain't gonna grow if we don't bury them. Right, Mommy? <laughs> mm -hmm. We're going through a stage where everything is ours. <laughs> My. It is yours. You just, just not yet. Just not yet. Alrighty. 
And there goes the corn. Time to get these peppers put in. I always do a good bit of peppers. We do like our peppers here. We're gonna put those right there. That's a poblano. That's a poblano. You only gonna space these about a foot apart, the peppers. Get a little bit deeper than that, maybe. And now on to the bananas. We got six banana peppers. And that's what's going in next. Alrighty. And then on to the four bell peppers. And there's the peppers. Now, time for the tomatoes. Now, we've got some tomatoes that we've never tried before in here. So we're really not sure how our tomatoes are gonna do this year. We've seeded them all ourselves, except for the two that we were gifted by Danny's parents. And the uh, two that we were gifted are some tried and true beefsteak tomatoes. So those ones will definitely be good. Now, some of these Amish ones not sure how they're gonna turn out, but we're gonna try them anyway. You know, actually I'm gonna put the beans in first, just so I know how much room I have to work with, with the tomatoes here. And we're growing bush beans. Um, those of you who have ever tried pole beans know that strings aren't the best in the world. And we've had a lot better luck with bush beans and not having disgusting strings in our beans. So that's why we do bush beans instead of pool beans. So we've tried to string them out, de-string them, and it seems no matter how hard you try, there's always a string or 100. Kitoki. So since we got such a small garden, we usually go with the minimum plant spacing. In this case, 18 inches. <laughs> Someone's got some fireworks a little early. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I can't wait for the fourth. We're going to have quite a fireworks show this year. I think it's going to be our best one yet. Now, we only have so many tomato cages, so we're going to split the difference with these. It ain't going to be perfect, but better than nothing.
Alrighty, now that we got the garden in, let's do a quick tour. Up top here, we got two rows of sweet corn. Around the cucumber trellis, we've got six hills of cucumbers, three on each side, and then in the middle, we've got some lettuce, and it is a butterhead blend, which we have been growing it in containers in the back porch, and it is delicious. So you can either harvest the baby leaves, or you can let it go to a head and collect the whole head of lettuce. So that's pretty awesome. Down here, We've got four hills of zucchinis, which we are super pumped for because, so we've been having an issue with white rust on our zucchini plants. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's like a little white dust that settles in and it's kind of like a mildew or a mold. And it just, once it sets into the plant, it just chews it up. We had them, <laughs> you know, last time we planted this two years ago, we had it show up after we had gotten zucchinis for a couple of weeks and i mean it's, it felt like overnight the leaves were just covered and they disappeared so we wanted to give a soil or rest from zucchinis for a year so this is our first year planting them in two years and we're pretty excited can't can't beat some good fried zucchini zucchini stir fry you shred that zucchini up and you could put it inside of zucchini bread or make some other sort of pasta dishes with it i mean it is just so good and we are so excited to try it again so continuing the tour We've got our two rows of bush beans, green beans down there. On the far side, we've got radishes. We've got peppers. We've got some poblanos, which are awesome for having stuffed peppers or for sides and Mexican dishes. We've got our six banana peppers, which we love to put in our banana pepper mustard. And we've got four bell peppers, which we love to just chop up and stick in the freezer and keep those for recipes and we got eight tomatoes just a combination of slicer tomatoes and paste tomatoes the paste ones are great for recipes and stuff and the slicers just I mean, it's hard to beat a fresh tomato from the garden now because of all the deer we have in this neighborhood and raccoons and groundhogs and bunnies we've got to string some electric fence around these poles here um, if we still want to have a garden at the end of the day in case you guys wonder why we roll this up and then unroll it every year well the real reason is because we don't want to waste electricity or the service life of our fence charger so we don't run it whenever we don't have stuff growing in the garden and the thing with not turning it on is we don't want the deer to ever meet this and not be met with a shock otherwise they will lose their training whatever training we established with the herd and uh, the next time they see delicious looking plants in the garden they're going to assume this is off and they're going to bust right on in and even if they don't get the plants in their belly what's going to happen is what we've had to happen in the past when we first started electric fences is they're going to trample them knock our trellises over rip the plants up by the roots we just don't want that so we only put this up whenever the charger is on so anytime the deer meets this they're met with a shock of discouraging them from trampling into our garden and also, we don't want them just to trample on there anyway and break our wire, which is pretty cheap, uh, especially compared to the fence charger, but it's a pain in the butt to have to replace it all the time. And if we don't have stuff growing, why, why even waste the time uh, and energy to fix something that's not protecting anything? So that's why we roll it up every year. Kind of a pain in the butt, but at least it's only a pain in the butt twice a year and not every time a deer decides it wants in the garden. Alrighty, now we gotta connect the fence wire.
to the bus. Just so we get good good contact here between the copper and the fence wire. The last thing we do is around the corner here where the fence wire hits the wood, there's a very little bit of shorting out going on there uh, whenever it's wet. So what we do is we put a little plastic insulator. These are, we call them poor man insulators. <laughs> there's just a little piece of, I don't know, plastic conduit we bought. Uh, stick them right around here. So there's a, a little barrier between the, the wood and the metal. It seems to help a little bit. It keeps it's like a on a little roof to keep the water off of the off of the fence wire there. Now, pro tip with these, uh, <laughs> I found this out the hard way. If you are packing the fence up for the winter, um, in the you know hot fall day, and you're sticking these in your pocket, that's a no-no. The reason being is spiders like to make their nests inside of there and one time I had a pocket full of these and a pocket full of spiders so that's uh that's one of those lessons they say the hard ones are the best learned because you don't soon forget them well that was a hard lesson to learn because that creeped me out having a pocket full of spiders so yeah don't put these in my pocket anymore I got a little dish to stick them in instead one other big change this year is we've upgraded to a solar charger Instead of the wall charger, I guess the wall charger we're just going to save till we get a farm and use that for our perimeter fence or whatever. Um, it is a 50 mile charger, so it'll be plenty for that. Um, but what we had been doing is the wall charger is down at the house, which is in that direction. And we ran a direct burial line or so it was advertised straight underground, about a foot buried underground right up to the fence here. And what happened is apparently the wire was not direct burial because it kept shorting out and you can hear it popping underground. And every time that started popping underground, it lost about half of the voltage up at the fence here. So that thing was usually hitting about 8,000 volts. <laughs> but whenever it was popping and shorting out underground, it was about 3,500, 4,000. So uh, we didn't, didn't like to lose all that juice. So we just bought this solar charger here. And this is what we're going to use up at the garden here for now. Alrighty, that's 10.2 kilovolts. That means it's 10,200 volts. So if the deer meets that, I don't think he will be back soon. So that's a win. Alrighty, the last thing we got to do now is soak it down real good and make sure all these transplants and new seeds have a chance to germinate and get strong here. And hopefully we'll get a good harvest at the end of the year, Lord willing. <laughs> That's a little wet. It's a little cold. But we're good. And one last thing, we're going to get these chickens on some fresh grass. So between our two breeds of chickens we raise here, we have barred rocks for the eggs and we've got Cornish crosses for the meat. Uh, we no longer buy any chicken meat or eggs at the grocery store, which is the large proponent of that 15% figure we put in the title. We do 25 meat chickens in the spring and 25 in the fall and then we have the about to be 11 egg chickens.
please make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and we'll see y'all next time.